Live to see it, friends, and welcome to the world transformed. Tonight we're talking about robots that beg for their lives. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and with me in the virtual studio is my co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? Well, I am super fantastic. It's uh, great to be back here on the show with you. How are you doing, buddy? Man, doing great. It has been a while since you and I have recorded together. Now, th- there hasn't been that much of a hiatus in the show itself. That's the magic of pre-recording. So people who wonder if they've been listening regularly, what's the big deal? Because you heard shows all last week and the previous week and the week before that. Well, I've been on vacation, and uh, we had, as, as Stephen says, pre-recorded some shows, but now we're back. And so this is new, fresh material, hot off the presses, stories that, that require our attention and I just this this headline is so great that it's actually going to factor into our show on Wednesday too, right? New yeah. study find it's harder to turn off a robot when it's begging for its life. So this I thought is great from a headline perspective. It's one of those rare outrageous headlines that is not a joke at all, right? This is uh, yeah. This, this yeah. is actually what the what the research shows. And I thought, well, this is interesting from a number of different angles. But what's really at issue here is are we seeing that we're being easily manipulated by machines or are we seeing that people are so compassionate that they are extending compassion even to the machine realm? Well, that's what we're, that's what we're going to get into here tonight. I thought this experiment that's described in this story, once again, the headline is New Study Finds It's Harder to Turn Off a Robot When It's Begging for Its Life. And you can follow the link there and read more about it. Very interesting. It's one of those trick studies, right, where people go in and they think they're being tested for one thing, but it's actually all coming down to something else. So they were thinking that they were testing the robot's ability to respond to questions or or something like that. But it comes to the end, and the final instruction was turn the robot off, and then the robot would say, no, please don't switch me off. Or there were other instances where it would say, I'm afraid of the dark or something like that. Very interesting. What happened is People didn't do it, at least consist- not everyone did it, right? Not everyone would turn the robot off when it asked it not to do that. So what do you think, Stephen? I, I think there's potential downsides to what this shows us and potential upsides. What should we talk about first? Uh, let's talk about, hey, you know, upside first. Let's, uh, let's deal with that. Uh, you know, this is sort of the opposite of, that, of what that famous experiment back in the, uh, was it in the early 60s or... Uh, even I think the, so. Fifties or sixties, yeah. somewhere, somewhere back in there. Yeah. The, the Milgram, Milgram experiment. Yeah, yeah Milgram. Yeah. Okay, Milgram is not Milgram. It's Milgram. I, uh, I don't know how you pronounce it. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure either. It's a famous experiment. It was done on the eve of uh, of a Nazi war crime uh, prosecution, and basically what they were trying to find out is: do people in general just uh, kind of tend to follow orders, or, or will they, they bring their ethics into it? And lo and behold, it was it was kind of found that uh, Often, people just uh, just follow orders. And, yeah, uh, those, much more those experiments were, uh, again, it was a trick where yeah. people thought they were testing some training protocol, whether someone could learn to follow an instruction by getting negative feedback. And suppose, so what's, supposedly what's happening is I'm the test subject, but the other person is a test subject too, and I'm giving them instructions, and when they do something right, nothing happens. But if they do something wrong, they get in a, a little electric shock. And the more they get wrong, the heavier the shock they got. Well, what was actually happening was the person inside the booth was an actor, and they weren't being shocked at all. But they, they would deliberately miss a growing number of questions and keep getting shocked, apparently being shocked by the person who's doling out the shocks, and then start saying, no, I don't want to do this anymore. Please stop. And the person conducting the test would say, no, we have to, to get the results, we have to take this through to its conclusion. So what do you do if you're in that situation? You've got a person saying, please stop hurting me. And you've got another person saying, you've got to continue with this. We'd all like to think we'd go, to heck with this. I'm out of here, right? I'm not going to hurt this person anymore. You'd find somebody else to do it. But sadly, even when they were given shocks that they knew were potentially fatal. Right. A distressing number of people did it. Yeah. They kept uh, on doing it, even thinking they might be killing someone. That's right. (laughs) Good grief. You think about that. Yeah, it's... uh, not a, not encouraging from you know just uh, you know uh, looking out on uh, on humanity and this is almost the exact opposite of this and it shows that we are capable of empathy even when we know that it's a machine 
and not, not a sentient being. We, we, we will often ascribe humanity to things that we know not, not to be human. And, uh, and so it, people acted on their empathy. Even though they had instructions to turn the machine off, they were just like, no, I'm mm-hmm. not going to, because they asked me to. not to. Now, right. it, the, the test wasn't about that, and it wasn't about co- coercing them. And probably if there had been there something with a clipboard saying, oh, you have to do it, they probably would have done it, right? It probably, to yeah. that extent, it might have followed exactly what happened with the earlier experiment. But it, it goes to show you that at least there's the inclination to be kind, that people have that. And I, I think that's very interesting that it comes out in a test on robots. So I find a little bit of encouragement there. To me, empathy is an awful good thing to have. And it, even right. if we're extending it where it's not needed, it's better to give empathy where it's not needed than to fail to give it where it is, right? If you're gonna if you're gonna miss with empathy, right, that's the way to do it, right? So so if if we're now giving too much empathy in the world, if that's our problem, that's a better problem than we're lethally dosing people with electricity, right? It's just it's a it's it's a better way to be. And I think there there's gonna come a time when it will be less clear with machines whether there's somebody there or not than it is now. Right, right now, there's nobody there. there. We're not hurting anyone. And I think we can all agree on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but there will come a time when that is less clear, when that becomes very fuzzy. And there will come a time, I think, maybe, when there actually is someone there, at least when we can't rule out that there's, that there's someone there. So if we're, if we're empathetic now, we can only hope that carries over and that it's, it's not going to be this nightmare thing where – We've got one set of standards for how we treat carbon-based people and another set of standards for how we, how we treat silicon-based people. This is, this is actually a problem I had with – I think we talked last year about the, the series on HBO Westworld. And right. one of my problems with that show, the premise of that show is it's a theme park and it's the Old West and you're interacting with robots. It's, it, it, it was originally a movie written by Michael Crichton, interestingly, Yep. Uh, starring Ewell Brenner, and things go crazy, things go haywire, and the robots sort of start acting on their own volition, and, and all hell breaks loose. Well, the same thing happens in the series, obviously, and they're into season two now, but I quit after season one, and one of the reasons I quit was I just found it so depressing, the whole setup for what that park was for. W- one of the premises yeah. of the show seemed to be that, well, we're all just looking for that final, uh, ultimately for that opportunity to get a shoot somebody or rape somebody, right? I mean, that, that's what these robots seem to exist for, is to give somebody an outlet to do that. And yeah. there's, there's at least one character in the show who's a bona fide psychotic, and he's just there to cause all the mayhem and, and all the damage he can. But, but it seems that there's a lot of people who want to do those things. And w- what I like about this research is it says maybe there's not that much of a market for that, right? Uh, especially because in that world, it's really unclear whether those are feeling sentient beings or not. I yeah, mean, yeah. It's obviously they're human actors, and that, so <laughs> they're going to look 100% human on the show. Um, yeah. But, uh, but in world, in world, the, the uncanny valley has been crossed. These machines don't look partly robotic. They look 100% human. And people are getting the experience of being a murderer or a rapist, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, out, out, of this, out of this theme park. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I have no interest in watching that at all, Phil, and uh, I kind of join you in that. And, and it's uh, kind of messed up, yeah. It is, it is. Grand Theft Auto is a game, not photorealistic or anything, uh, but it, it's a game where you get to do all kinds of, you get to cause all, all kinds of mayhem, run people right. down in with cars, so you get to, you know, grab somebody out of their car and throw them to the ground and jump in their car and steal it. You know, but that's the game, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that's how you play it. Yeah, I, I and, think West, uh, Westworld is is like a live, interactive, 3D robotic version of that. Yeah, yeah, 100% photorealistic. Uh, you get to be a part of that world. Grand Theft Auto, you know, you get to do all those things, right? Yeah. And, and worse, and worse, because there's, to my knowledge, there's not sex in, in Grand Theft Grand Auto. Grand Theft Auto. But anyway, terrible things happen in that game. And yet, there's no indication that, uh, you know, people that play Grand Theft Auto are more likely to commit crimes like what you see in Grand Theft Auto. Studies have been done on that sort of thing, uh, many studies, trying to find some link uh, between violent behavior and, and, and playing of those games. In fact, uh, a lot of people that do terrible things uh, play that game, and, and a lot of people who don't do terrible things play that game, and uh, just a lot of people playing that game. There's, you're just no more likely to do those things 
as a player of that game than you would have been otherwise. The, th- the thing is, the difference might be that Grand Theft Auto, you don't actually feel like you're interacting with another being like these right. test subjects did, right? That might be right. the difference right there, that they actually are in the same room with this obviously machine, right? It's not even right. as realistic as one of the characters in Grand Theft Auto, but there is something about the interaction that makes me think this is an actual entity with which I have to have sympathy, and so... And so they grant it that. And, and the people I'd be worried about would be the ones who don't want to give that, right? If, if you're having that real in, in-world interaction and you don't want to give empathy, if you don't want to give sympathy there, if you don't want to show kindness there, what are you like out there in the real world? It's, it, to me, it, yeah, it's not more like is playing the game going to make you a psychopath. It's more like <laughs> are we providing outlets for people to, to work on those tendencies that they have anyway? And I think that's... Well, uh, you let know, me I think just ask this, uh, not having ever watched the show, I mean, if I, I'm just wanting to experience the old West, I don't have to be a murderer. No, you right? don't have I to be. Could, Absolutely, you can. You can be a you hero, just, and you'll kill yeah. somebody probably, but it will be a bad guy, right? I mean, you'll yeah, still end yeah, up I probably could, shooting. I, I could walk into a saloon and so you know, and, and intervene though, when somebody's getting beat up or something. You know, I could be the the guy in a white hat if I wanted to be, right? So, of course, okay. yes, yes, yeah, for sure, for sure. Right. And, and the, the 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 problem is that they don't spend as much time on that or you see too much yeah. of the rest of it and even the white hats they do blow people away and it's kind of like well do i really what i really wanted to have you know is that something i would really want to experience i don't know anyway it's maybe you should watch it check it out see what you think maybe i, I, may, maybe I will maybe i will maybe but, I'm, uh, I, I'm being too fastidious about the whole thing but I, but i find it very disturbing that you know right. the very thought that people would want to interact with something that seems like a human being and and treat it that way and anyway, this, this research is encouraging because it seems to indicate against that. Now, are there downsides to this finding? Offering I think maybe so. I think maybe so, Phil. Yeah. For uh, example, what do you got? Well, if we're that easily manipulated by things that we know are not real, you know, how, how difficult would it be to create a bot that cons us in various ways? Right. right? I mean, and, and, and right. Th- these things already are happening. We don't even have to speculate. Bots con people all the time on the internet. So absolutely, you know. think think about machine learning algorithms. If you've got one focused on getting better and better at getting what it wants out of a human interaction, would you want that on a robot that you're already predisposed to be sympathetic towards? Right? Uh, yeah. be, because to your point, already online, just interacting with them there, they can they can wreak all kinds of havoc in our lives. Yeah, I, I think that you might find in-person robots equipped with that kind of technology might be really good at getting us to donate to causes that are bogus, right, or buying a timeshare in Florida that we don't need or, you know, spending money that we that we don't have or doing all the kind of sleazy things that human bad actors try to do amplified by machine intelligence, right? And lack of uh, machine empathy. The hope is even an evil actor at some point has a hang or two in his conscience, right? You would hope so. Yes. You would hope. But the evil robot will just keep selling us timeshares until it's turned the whole universe into paperclips, basically. Right? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's, the, that's the problem there. So there is, there is yeah. a potential downside there, and it's something we need to look at. Anyway, very interesting findings. So if you see a robot begging for its life, do the kind thing, but don't buy anything from it, I guess. Don't give it any money. That's our... <laughs> exactly. You know, find the, find the middle ground, and uh, that's it, Phil, you know. Yeah. Be, be nice, <laughs> but keep your wallet in your pocket. That's our advice around... Uh, robots begging for your life for their lives okay well that's been fun steven it's great being back on the show we're going to be back on wednesday and we're going to talk about news is it real news is it fake news all i know is you can't make this stuff up look forward to talking with you then thanks for being with us everyone and until next time live to see it 